First, in terms of the review session for that for the Saturday before, um, how many would like to do it? Let's say at uh, two o'clock on Saturday. Okay. How about uh, is that okay? Is two o'clock on Saturday? Is there anybody that's got a real problem with that? Okay. I'm going to try to reserve the room then. Um, I'll try to reserve this room for two o'clock on on the Saturday, which is the third. I think that's yeah, that's that's the third, right? So I'll try to reserve uh, here for two o'clock. Uh, for the review session. Okay. Um, second is the classic album of the week this week is The Doors. This is the this is their this is their first album, um, and. Uh, how many have heard the song Light My Fire? Okay, yeah. So there was a short version, like a three and a half minute version that was on the radio because in those days, the AM radio, because um, they had commercials and stuff, they didn't, they, you know, they didn't go on for more than three, three and a half minutes was a long song. But so this has an 11 minute version. And then when FM was just starting, the FM station would play the 11 minute version. So anyway, um, and anybody know how old uh, uh, Jim Morrison was when he died? No? He really needs some rock and roll history. Yes. He was what? Close, 27. There was a whole bunch of rock and roll people that died at the age of 27, including Janis Joplin. But anyway, um, uh, uh, Brian Jones, The Rolling Stones. Um, so anyway, uh, Jim Morrison uh, was 27 when, when he ended up dying. But uh, anyway, uh, great album, uh, The Doors, uh, Break On Through to the Other Side. You might have heard that one as well. So anyway, take a listen to, uh, to The Doors. Um, all right, so what we've been talking about, uh, last time we were basically talking about who, who owns property? And we said, well, um, we've talked a bit about you know, private goods and, and public goods, right? And we said that, again, from econ, those, those that you had public choice and public finance, you know, public goods, we already talked about this. Um, they have this characteristic that they're non-rivalrous in consumption, that is, my consumption of it doesn't affect your consumption, um, and that everyone gets the same amount. Right, you get the same amount of the fireworks as, as I do, um, and they're difficult to exclude. And of course, private goods are the opposite, right? Uh, a purely private good, uh, which is, uh, uh, hot dog, right? Go to Coney and Swirls and get a hot dog. It's rivalrous in consumption. I can't eat the same hot dog that you do. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, we don't all get the same amount of the hot dog. You know, there's one hot dog. Uh, if I eat half the hot dog, uh, or if I, eat three, if I eat three quarters of the hot dog and I give it to you, you only get one quarter. Uh, and we can exclude you, right? I mean, you can go down to Coney's and Swirls, and if you don't pay for the hot dog, you don't get it. Right? So we said that goods lie on a continuum between purely private and purely public. Um, so when you're forming the law, you want to sort of look at and say, okay, um, how should we structure the, the, the law? And should some goods be publicly owned? Uh, that is uh, national defense, you know, as a service that's publicly owned, whereas cleaning somebody's house is a service that can be privately owned. Uh, and so that we try to structure it in, in, and, and notice that um, when we talked about the, the Hobbesian and the uh, normative, Hobbesian normative coast, you know, we start to deal with, okay, how should the law look uh, even when there's some part of uh, public goodness to it? So um, 
again, we, and we, we said that, you know, one of the problems with the public ownership of a private good, we said, was there'd be overuse of it, right? It's, this was this tragedy of the commons. Um, and again, I guess uh, um, uh, Professor Clark just told me this morning that he used my example of the buffalo that I use in Ecom 105, that if, if, you, uh, if you don't shoot the buffalo, right, somebody else 100 yards down is going to shoot the buffalo. Uh, and so there's going to be overuse of any, any uh, good that is, uh, uh, that's going to be uh, publicly owned. And uh, we said that you know, using the, from the, the movie Gorillas in the Mist, uh, the idea is that government doesn't often have a good reason or ha isn't incentivized to carefully monitor uh, how, that, how that good might be used. Um, so what, what we tend to have public ownership, right, of public goods, this tend to be publicly owned, but, and then of course private, we want to have, again, privately owned. So in this case, what are we going to what are we going to try to do? We're going to have uh, property rights well defined, right? We said that was one of the things that we said that DeSoto had mentioned that a failure to define property rights very well is what led to uh, a um, why Latin America and South America uh, have been behind uh, economically compared to, uh, to compared to North America. Um, there's a famous uh, a famous article, though, that by Ronald Coase, again of the Coase theorem, but he wrote a, another article uh, called The Lighthouse in Economics. And 1974, um, uh, in the Journal of Law and Economics. And if you, again, are thinking about what your paper is going to look like, what you're going to write your paper on. Again, the paper is going to be due at the end of the semester. Um, and um, like I said, eight to 10 pages on any topic that you want that has to do with law and economics. You can fit it in there. Anyway, um, the Journal of Law and Economics, which we have on JSTOR, you can get on it um, you know, through the magic of the internet. Uh, and uh, anyway, the Journal of Law and Economics is a journal that you might want to look through when you're looking at maybe looking up topics that you might find interesting. So anyway, 1974, um, what he pointed out is that lighthouses uh, were privately owned uh, and they functioned as uh, privately owned. Uh, uh, the, and and the, it, it's an interesting uh, an interesting paper to read to talk, talk about history of lighthouses and et cetera. Um, there are some people that wrote articles saying they didn't quite have it right or whatever. And I put that uh, article in the, in the folder. Uh, and so again, or you can just look it up uh, anyway. But the point being is that normally public goods are owned publicly and private goods are owned privately. But you can find instances where there are some public goods that are uh, owned privately. And of course, um, the point here is that uh, establishing uh, clear property rights uh, is, uh, is something that you need to have, uh, have goods that are privately owned. Um, you also have what we talked about a little bit earlier is this issue of why do these things tend to be uh, publicly owned is because you have this free rider problem, right? That is, if you have a private good that's publicly owned, uh, then you got this tragedy of the commons issue. Um, but if you have a good that um, is a, a, a public good that's privately owned, what's the free rider problem? The free rider problem is that um, it's difficult to exclude me, so how do you get me to pay, right? You, uh, if we sa said, uh, oh, um, you're in a neighborhood and you guys decide that you're going to get the road plowed, okay? Well, plowing that road, once that road is plowed, right, I mean, that has some features of public goods to it, right? That is, the road's plowed from, if, if, if three of you uh, pay for having the road plowed and I don't, right, I'm going to get to drive on the road. And my driving on the road, once it's plowed, doesn't, you know, doesn't affect how much plowed the road is, is for you. 
And it's difficult to exclude in the sense that you probably don't have somebody standing right at the, uh, you know, at the end of the road uh, to make sure that everybody that is, uh, you know, driving on that, you know, everybody in the neighborhood actually paid to have the road plowed, right? So um, there's some, some of this uh, free rider issue is why public goods uh, tend to be publicly owned uh, and not privately owned. Um, but um, so uh, public goods have this, have this problem of the free rider because of this difficult, dif difficult to exclude issue to it. Uh, now, we, we've talked a little bit about, um, and, and we'll talk a little bit later on, but how you might figure out ways to get around that. That is, we talked about broadcast television, uh, that one mechanism to make it so that broadcast television could work is although the signal, I couldn't block you, once you put your antenna up there, I couldn't block you from getting the signal, but what I could do is figure out uh, a private good within the I Love Lucy show that is commercials. And that was a thing that I could exclude you from, right? If you didn't pay, you couldn't run your commercial. And so uh, we come up with mechanisms to deal with some of these problems. Uh, and, you know, the law uh, has to be there to allow the sale of commercials, right? I mean, so you have to sort of structure what, what happens if you don't pay, you know, do you still get to run your commercial and et cetera, right? So we had to structure the law to, to deal with that. Another question is, um, would some things exist, uh, would some things exist if you didn't have public ownership? And so let's think about um, Yosemite or uh, Yellowstone. How many have ever been to either Yosemite or Yellowstone? Oh, quite a few of you. Okay. All right. So great place to be, right? Um, would, would Yellowstone or Yosemite be there if, the, if, if that you couldn't have it publicly owned? That if, if it had to be a private, uh, private thing? Well, it might be um, because you could charge people to get into Yosemite. And of course, they, you know, they do charge an entrance fee to get in. Uh, you know, when the, with, I don't know who's the, probably U.S., whoever owns the, uh, you know, the, the rights there, the, uh, you, you pay to, to get in. Um, actually, once you're a certain age, uh, you can get a, uh, a, a really cheap uh, uh, senior uh, pass where you can get in to all the parks at really cheap rate. But anyway, you're not there yet. Um, but uh, the, the, the bottom line is, is that it may not exist because it might be that they don't collect enough revenue to pay for the existence of Yosemite or Yellowstone or whatever. So maybe it wouldn't be there. Now, you might, probably lots of us, would like to have Yosemite be there or Yellowstone be there even if we're never going to go, right? Even if we don't, we, 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 we want it to be available in some sense, right? I want to, if you haven't ever been to Yellowstone, you might think, hey, I'd sure like to go one day. I mean, I've never um, uh, been to Mount Rushmore, okay? But I'd like to have Mount Rushmore there because one day I might be able to go. So how can I make it that availability there, right? Um, well, uh, what does that mean? It might be that there's uh, transactions costs right, uh, to, uh, uh, to getting Yellowstone and Yosemite uh, to be produced through the private sector. Now, we already talked about the fact that you could create the Nature Conservancy, for example. I mean, that was one way that we talked about reducing those uh, transactions costs of, uh, you know, I could, I could, I could make the, uh, the Nature Conservancy, I could create an entity, a legal entity, the Nature Conservancy, that can own property and collect, uh, you know, uh, collect donations, et cetera, right? Hire people, okay? Um, and they then collect your $5 or $20 or whatever and combine it all, and then they, they go buy property that uh, you want to preserve, okay? 
but it may be that it might be more efficient to, in a sense, to have the government own it, all right? Uh, because of this free rider issue, that is, if you guys all donate to making Yosemite happen, then I get the fact that Yosemite exists, even though I haven't done anything with it, right? So you have these trade-offs, uh, and you have to sort of think through um, what's the most likely, uh, the, the most likely outcome. Uh, so, the, you know, will Yosemite exist? Um, is it efficient for them ex to exist, right? Do, do we want Yosemite to exist? Uh, or is how it's going to work, you know, if you take Econ 415, uh, when we talk about public choice, uh, would it be that the um, some uh, uh, lobbying uh, unit of, uh, some of the environmental group uh, may get the government to, uh, to create Yosemite, even though the benefit to the people that are being taxed, right, might be less than the value to the people that uh, gain from Yosemite, okay? It's difficult to measure that, right? So there's no correct answer in some sense. Um, you have to just sort of, as I said, there may be some things where it's obvious, uh, you know, who values the stop sign at Milnes in US 12. Uh, but there's, there, you know, sometimes you just have to, um, you have to take a guess in some sense. But, to, but the, the point is to realize these trade-offs, right? It's just a matter of seeing and observing that we talk about in Econ 105 a lot, right? Uh, it's not that we're gonna know what the correct answer is perfectly, but let's think through what we need to know. And in some cases, it's gonna be clear. And in some cases, uh, in some cases it's, it, it's not gonna be. So if we look at, uh, and I uh, included an article just over the, uh, the last couple of days um, on the takings clause in the Constitution, right? What is article, or, um, this is the Fifth Amendment, excuse me. If we look at the, the Fifth Amendment, um, what does it do? It allows for takings, right, with just compensation. So what does it do? It allows the government to take your privately owned property, right, if it's used for a public purpose, if it gives you just compensation, okay? So I, I put in an article that, uh, that discusses this issue, and later on we'll talk about this, um, uh, whether the, uh, you know, there's, uh, what, what is a public purpose? Could the government say, oh, it's a public purpose to have this factory over here, okay, because that'll benefit, Hills, it'll benefit Hillsdale, okay, for there to be a factory. Could the government come along and take your property, you didn't want to sell it, but it's going to take your property, and then it's going to, uh, the public purpose is to give it to General Motors to open up a factory, okay? So, and of course there's been U.S. Supreme Court cases that we'll talk about that, that deal with the situation. Um, but again, the point is, can you have a privately owned piece of property, you know, which is a bundle of property rights, can we have this privately owned piece of property and then have, have it then become publicly owned? And how do you go about doing that, right? How you, you, you've structured your constitution to say you can do that, right? The Fifth Amendment says you can do that, okay? How do you then determine what just compensation is, what's a public purpose, right? All those things then have to be structured within, uh, within the law. All right, so that leads us to the next section, uh, which is section seven. Um, what can an owner do with a property? Okay, you have the property rights. Can you do any old thing with it? So this was uh, section seven there. Um, can you do any old thing with it? 
Well, I mean, we've already talked about this, about what? Externalities. This is where right? My use of my property may affect your property values. So you might say, hey, um, we, th th this is what we talk about laws against blight, okay? So can, can I just go ahead and um, uh, uh, do any old thing with my property? Well, you, you're gonna, you, what do you have? You, you have uh, laws in, uh, in different, different municipalities that say, no, you can't do this, right? You have zoning laws that says, oh, you can't open up a business uh, within this area within the, the, the city, okay? Or you can open up this type of business in this area within the city. Because maybe you have this neighborhood and somebody puts in a Walmart and, and what happens is then you have all this traffic and uh, you, know, you have all sorts of problems uh, that because the people that own that property and then sold it to Walmart and then Walmart builds their, their, uh, their uh, business there, then that's affecting your property value. So should you have zoning laws? And, and if you do, how should they work? Well, uh, again, it's a matter of thinking through, okay, is this an externality issue? Uh, and uh, if it is, should we have a Hobbesian agreement or should we have a, uh, have a Cosian agreement? So I published an article on uh, the sale of development rights in uh, preservation of open space uh, back in Wayne Law Review back in the 1990s, uh, early 1990s. And the issue then was, okay, can I sell just the development rights? So we could all get together, you own this piece of property, and, what we're, and, and we don't want to buy the property. What we want to do is just buy part of the property, right? Because we said that what, what, what is property, right? It's, it's, it's rights out there. So there's this right attached to your land that you can develop it, okay? And we could go along and say, I don't want to have to buy the land, but I'll buy those property rights away from you, okay? So what might happen is our value to our houses in the neighborhood may, ex having this uh, not be developed into a, a Walmart, our value may be greater than the value to, uh, to Walmart and then to you of selling that property and allow it to be developed. So again, sort of just sort of thinking through um, how uh, th this, this issue of what happens if my property, uh, use of my property affects your use of the property, um, then we may, con we may constrain uh, what you can do with your property so we make it so that you, we, we have a law that says you can't do this, right? This is this Hobbesian idea that the transactions cost of us all bargaining with you is, are too high. And so we're going to assign the property right if we, we can figure out who's got the uh, values at the most. Uh, or do we do something that what they talk, sort of talk about in the book is lubricating things? Do we, do we try to reduce the bargaining costs so that, uh, so that these things will, will move to their highest use? So again, if you have low transactions costs, right, if we have low transactions costs, then we're gonna move towards coast, right? Um, we're gonna sign the property right and let people bargain. Again, when you write the law, you have to be clear what that property right is, okay? So you've got to establish what development rights are. You have to write that out in the law, make it clear so that there can be a contract, but assign the property rights and then people will bargain. So what I would be doing is I'd be writing the law so that I've clearly defined what the property rights, and I do think so I write the law so that it's, it's easier for you to bargain. I'm gonna to try to reduce those uh, search costs. That I, I gotta know that there are development rights out there. Right? I mean, if you, if, if, if you guys don't know in your neighborhood that there is a such thing as buying the development rights, okay, if you don't know about that, then how are you gonna, you know, how are you gonna solve, the, how, solve this thing? 
Um, so, uh, you know, you do the search costs and the bargaining costs and the, and the enforcement costs, okay? So you want to do things which will, uh, will reduce those things. If there's high transactions cost, right, then you have Hobbs, right? You try to assign the property right. Right, the normative Hobbs, you try to assign the property right. Now, um, we noted that then you got to know what the relative values are if you just assign it, okay? Um, uh, we also noted that if, if you know the absolute value, then maybe you want to use comp compensation because that will at least allow somebody to, to obtain the property right without having to bargain, right? I can just choose to go ahead and do whatever it is uh, and then compensate you for that, right? So at least, even if there's high transactions costs, that, 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 uh, that uh, property right may move to the person that values it the most if, you set the, if you're able to uh, know what the absolute value is to, uh, to one person, then you can, uh, th then you can um, uh, use compensation as a mechanism uh, to, to do that. Now, in general, Custom solves a lot of this, right? So if you think about how does, you know, custom solves at least some of this. Um, this uh, good friend of mine from, uh, from high school and then um, actually I ended up uh, in graduate school, uh, I, I roomed with him in, in graduate school for a couple years. He, he actually was when I was up at Berkeley. He, uh, uh, he just was, worked at Groden's Clothing and just moved in, to, you know, because I wasn't making very much money as a graduate student. Um, uh, and so I needed a roommate. So he came up and, uh, and worked at Groden's uh, in uh, uh, sold, sold clothes and for a couple years. But, but anyway, so later on after I, you know, moved to, you know, eventually got to Michigan and uh, 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 he and his wife came out and uh, had never been to Michigan before, they were astonished at how often people mowed their lawn. <laughs> uh, he just, he was, he was astonished that we, we have this custom out here that we, people mow their lawns uh, and when you're in the Midwest, it's just the nice thing to do, right? Um, and so, uh, what, what, what you don't normally drive along and, um, and see people have their, you know, their lawn growing too high, right? Why? Because you, you feel bad, right? Um, when, I, I often, when I'm deciding, oh, should I mow the lawn tomorrow, um, I think about, oh, what are the neighbors going to think if I don't mow the lawn, right? So um, there is this, and we, we've already talked about, you know, when do you, uh, on a Saturday morning, when, when, when do you fire up your lawnmower, right? You're not gonna fire it up before nine o'clock, but um, certainly by 11 o'clock you'll fire it up. So custom and tradition sort of solve some, some of these things. And we talked about uh, the movie Gran Torino, where, uh, where uh, uh, Clint Eastwood has the kid uh, fix, the, fix up the house across the street rather than his own house because of that externality's out there. And in particular, another guy, um, just another personal story, um, this guy that uh, I ran cross country and track with at, at uh, UCSB, um, he ended up moving to Fresno for a while uh, and then he, uh, uh, to, uh, to go to um, grad school at Fresno State, but anyway, um, he bought a house there, and then he sold it because he was moving. He actually mowed the neighbor's lawn when he had his house up for sale. He mowed the neighbor's lawn because the neighbor's lawn looking bad was affecting his property value, right? He wanted to make, it, make, make people think that when they moved into that neighborhood, everybody mows their lawn and makes it all uh, clean and nice. So uh, you actually do have examples uh, where custom and tradition uh, takes care of these things. What about, can I cut down a thousand-year-old redwood tree, right? Suppose there's a thousand-year-old redwood tree. Uh, 
If you say, hey, it's my property, right? Anybody ever been to Avenue of the Giants? Okay, Avenue of the Giants, it's in, uh, uh, it's in California, and what it is, it's publicly owned, right? And it is a national park where they preserved redwood trees. Because what was going on? When redwood trees were privately owned, they were cutting down all these uh, redwood trees that are up to a thousand years old, right? And just cutting them down and making them into, and your uh, redwood uh, was a, uh, uh, it's a type of lumber that people really liked having, okay? So it, what they did is there's, uh, there's a couple places, there's Grants Grove in the Sierra Nevadas, which is also a preservation of redwood trees. Um, so we're saying, no, guess what? We're gonna make it so that redwood trees, this, this area with the redwood trees is publicly owned, okay? Now what we could have done is said, no, you have, we're gonna take away part of your property rights. We're gonna say that you own the land, but you can't cut redwood trees down. I don't know if you've fallen, there's, uh, there's some fires going on out in the West Coast and I'm following that, right? Um, well, why are those fires happening? Part of it has to do with management of the forests, okay? Um, and part of it has to do with people being able to place houses in areas where uh, they, uh, where it's close to areas where fires could happen, okay? So two things, one is they're used to, uh, they're, um, they have control burning, and uh, the way control burning works is if you have a, uh, a fire and the, and let's say you have a fire that's you know, burning like this, what you would do is you'd come in and you'd put, a, you'd put a dozer line in, a bulldozer line in around here, and then you would use uh, drip torches and um, you would just light fire this way. And then what would happen is the heat from the main fire would draw these fires in and then it would burn out. So you have this burned out area. Well, that, if this were, I probably told you, you know, I fought fire for the state of California for six years. Um, that's how we used to do it back before you were born. Um, and, um, now you can't do that, right? Why is that? Because there's all these houses in here now. So if you look at what's going on is part of what's happening is that there's houses being built in areas and that then changes the methodology of fighting fire, which may change it so that there's larger fires than there otherwise would be. And the fact that their houses are in there leads to higher costs of fires. The way that um, control burning worked, uh, well, still does, the way control burning works is you say, okay, we're going to, um, we're gonna take areas of the forest and, or grasslands, and what we're gonna do is we're going to, again, put dozer lines around, and then we're gonna control burn this stuff. And, or, or you can log it out so that you don't get this huge buildup of the underbrush so that when a fire does happen, there's all sorts of fuel uh, that's tindered. Uh, or can you log, can you go in there and log this, uh, this property and say, hey, we're gonna go in and, and log out these dead trees or whatever. So to the extent that the government makes it so that you can't do that as much, what did you do? You created a situation where when the fire does happen, it's a, a much larger fire than you otherwise would have. So how do you structure the law, right? Do you wanna make the law so that we're out there and you uh, are supposed to put out every fire that happens because people have their houses all structured around there? Or do you wanna say, hey, you wanna build your house there, God love you, but if, we, if there's a fire, then you better protect the house yourself because we're going to let it 
we're going to let it burn, right? Um, or do you make it that you can't build the house there, right? So there's, again, no correct answer in the sense that we would know perfectly all the information, but it gives you some guidance on how do you want to structure, uh, how do you want to structure what the, what the law is and, and uh, what you can do with that. Um, the next section is, oh, but you ought to, Yes, you could. That's another thing you could do. You could say, you know what? If you build this house here, then you have to clear out five acres around the house, okay? Uh, which would then make it so that you couldn't have a house here and then a house only an acre apart, or you couldn't build a subdivision, right? So you could say, you know what? There's an externality to your having your house here and then having all this brush and timber close by, um, and so we're going to require you to, uh, uh, we're either going to not let you build the house there to start with, or we're going to say if you build the house, then you have to provide a clearance. Uh, and so uh, again, if you thought that the, if you thought that the California, uh, you know, Cal Fire it's now called, it, you know, if Cal Fire wasn't going to save your house, then you'd behave differently. Right, you 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 decide. Hey, maybe I sh maybe I should clear it out myself, um, or maybe I would uh, hire some private fire company to say, oh, hey, if there's a problem, you guys come in and and uh, and uh, uh, protect my particular house. <coughs> so again, um, there's there's lots of ways to deal with this. Uh, the issue is figuring out. What's the transactions cost? What's the ability to bargain? Those things all uh, would be considered when you're figuring out how you're going to structure the law uh, to deal with uh, to deal with these issues. All right, um, and right now you can't cut down a thousand-year-old redwood. Uh, has anybody ever seen where they have? Uh, the pictures of the where they were cutting the redwoods down, where uh, they they placed these boards, they you know like ten feet off the ground because the saws aren't large enough to cut the redwoods down. So they 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 had to cut like 15, 20 feet up in the air uh, where they could get that the diameter had gotten small enough that the uh, saws could uh, you know could cut the cut the uh, redwood trees down. So anyway, it's sort of interesting if, to take a look at that. Again, something maybe if you're uh, you know, thinking about what your um, paper might look like, I mean, that would be something you could talk about, maybe write a history of, uh, of logging uh, redwood trees and, and uh, how we structured the law around that. All right, the next section we're just going to skip over because we've already talked about it enough, I think, is this issue of uh, redistribution. Uh, and that was uh, section eight. And uh, this was this issue of should we use the law to structure property rights in a way that redistributes income from uh, one group to another? Um, and again, we went through why this is likely to be less efficient than a broad based uh, property tax, right? So we went through a list of things, um, but we noted this is going to be less efficient. If you're, if you're trying to accomplish redistribution, to do it through property rights, right? Well, say redistribution through property rights. We said that's going to be less efficient than a broad-based tax on income or profit if you're talking about uh, corporate income tax. Now again, um, just note that in some of you had public finance that these things will also have incentive issues to them, right? If what I do is I tax 
corporate profits, then it will affect how I structure my business. Okay? If you tax corporations differently than you do partnerships, which we do, um, then it may determine whether I form a S corporation or whether I form a limited liability co corporation, which the law allows us to do, right? There's a law that determines what an S corporation looks like and how it's taxed and uh, you know, how it can operate and how it can enter into contract and all that stuff, right? So you have a law about that, but then I have a C corporation uh, and C corporations are structured differently, okay, and they're taxed differently. So if you, if you have an S corporation or a partnership, let's say you have a law firm. Most law firms are partnerships. So that when you, when the, uh, let's say Miller Canfield law firm, uh, when it earns uh, profit, how does that get taxed? It gets taxed by going, it's a flow through, so it shows up on the income tax of the partners. Uh, and if you own uh, your partner, if you are a partner that owns 30% of the earnings of Miller Canfield, then Miller Canfield doesn't pay taxes on it. What happens is it flows through to you guys. But if Miller Canfield were a C corporation, let's say like Johnson & Johnson, okay, then it gets taxed as an entity, okay? And it's gonna be taxed at a different rate than you as an individual, okay? Um, uh, 2017, what do we do? We just cut the corporate income tax uh, in 2017. Now, it turns out that when we cut the corporate income tax, we just cut it to the average of the OECD countries, right? It wasn't like there was some cut in the corporate income tax in 2017 that made it so America has really low corporate income tax. We still have a corporate income tax, which is about what the average is. Um, but nonetheless, we, we, ch we, could, we changed people's behavior, right, by changing the economic incentives. So if we had a corporate income tax in order to uh, redistribute, uh, there's people running for president that have discussed this as an issue about raising the corporate income tax back to where it was, et cetera, and maybe using it to redistribute income. If you do that, then that could still have incentives, right? From if we take, uh, you know, public finance, then there's still going to be incentives will change, and so you'll get a different outcome than you otherwise would. Okay. Um, again, from 105, when we read Mises' Liberalism, okay, he talks about how redistribution is going to cause less, less output and, and less actually production for the masses. That's what he, you know, what he says. Um, so, but the, the point is, is that there's, if you're going to redistribute, right, you could do it by changing property rights. And again, we went through the problems with that. It is in fact true that a broad-based tax has broad-based in the sense that um, it cut, let's say it taxed all income at the same rate, then it wouldn't alter how you structured your uh, your corporate, you know, your company. Um, it wouldn't uh, alter the type of in if you know if we tax uh, labor income differently than we tax capital gains, then that will alter your behavior. If we had a broad-based tax, probably heard of the flat tax, um, right? So the flat tax is basically a tax on all income at the same rate, then that has less um, incentive changes than does, uh, uh, than, than would a, uh, a, either a narrow tax or a use of the, the property rights as a mechanism to, uh, you know, again, if you think about, uh, you know, do I have a limitation on how much you can charge your rent, right? Rent control, right? New York City got rent control. Um, and, uh, you know, Ann Arbor has rent control. Well, that will affect people's behavior about whether they're gonna create rental housing or they're gonna have uh, uh, single family dwellings, et cetera, right? All right. Um, let's just, the, the, the next thing that we're gonna talk about is uh, we're moving into chapter five. And how the, of course, 
And the way the course is, the, or the book is structured, and the way the course therefore has been structured, um, is that we're going to look more specifically, we're going to address the same topics that we just did. And if you look at each of the chapters, it'll have uh, criminal law and then topics in criminal law. Um, it'll have uh, the same thing with contract laws. Okay? So uh, we'll have different, again, if you, you know, look at the syllabus, uh, we're going to have a, a general discussion of a particular topic, whether it's uh, criminal law or whether it's uh, property law, uh, and then look at look in more detail at different uh, aspects of that. And so that's what we're going um, we're, we're to be talking about. Um, and in particular, um, we'll be talking about things like um, his information property, right? Um, and, uh, you know, just sort of uh, uh, think about uh, why do we care about whether property is privately owned. And just one, one quick point is that why should we care about, as economists, why should we care about whether we should have privately owned property rights? Why don't we just have it where the government owns everything? What's that? What do we call that economic structure where the government owns the property? Yeah, yeah we, socialism really is the, the communism sort of uh, blends the, um, the uh, political structure as well. But socialism, right, that's what, again, from Econ 105, right, how, how does socialism work? Well, the government owns the property. You don't have private property rights in a socialist system. Well, what's the issue? Changes people's incentives, right? Um, Right? People are going to behave differently if the government owns everything than if property rights are well defined and individuals can own those property rights. Okay? Uh, in particular, um, again, if you think back to Econ 105, we talked about Berzell and Rosenberg's book. Um, and uh, uh, Berzell and Rosenberg talk about um, uh, the history of economic growth and, you know, uh, in, the, uh, in the West, right? It's called How the West Grew Rich. Uh, and one of the main features they talk about is they said, innovation is the key. Innovation is the key to Western growth. Why is it that the West grew rich? I mean, they summarize it by saying, well, it's because of innovation, right? Now, we've talked about in 105, we focus on that you guys are all wealthier than the richest person in the world 100 years ago, right? Which uh, was John D. Rockefeller, right? If you sort of think about it, I mean, John D. Rockefeller, did, in, 19, in 1920, he didn't have cell phones, right? Didn't even have color motion pictures, right? Um, just quick little Wolfram story that when I was a kid, how many have seen uh, The Wizard of Oz, the movie The Wizard of Oz? Okay, right. Well, what happens is it goes from black and white to color, right, when she lands in Oz. We didn't have a color television. Right? When I was a kid, I didn't know any friends that had color television. <laughs> okay, so we missed the whole point that the colors changed. <laughs> Because when Dorothy lands in Oz, because we're still watching it in black and white, right? Um, so uh, think about you know all the innovations that have happened, and that's the key to Western growth. And so you want to structure the property law so that you advance innovation, right? All right. So for Monday, we're going to be working our way and through the rest of Chapter Five. And as we and again, I've put a couple more. Um, essay questions in the sample, sample questions, so make sure you're sort of looking through that. Uh, but the, we're going to get through chapter five for the midterm, okay? Uh, so, you know, you might just want to look through chapter five over the weekend uh, so that when I'm talking about something, 
you might want to focus on a little more, or you might be able to say, hey, I didn't quite get that. All right, so take a look through chapter five. Again, we're going to have the review session on two o'clock on the, the Saturday uh, of, uh, on October 3rd. All right, so the midterm's on, on the 5th, that Monday. All right? All right.